Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing the character study on Jacob. Uh, we'll be talking also quite a bit about, uh, as we did the last week with um, Esau, and possibly even reaching as far as uh, uh, getting into the story of Joseph. So we'll see how far I, we take this today. But uh, uh, the character study that we started on Joseph uh, uh, last week is uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So uh, you can go back and watch that so you can get this uh, study of Joseph, you know, all the way from the beginning. Uh, but right now I'm going to pick up with uh, chapter 30, what's happened uh, with Joseph, uh, Laban, his wives, and his children. And it's uh, quite a fascinating story. Uh, so what's happened is that uh, Joseph left his, uh, his home and went to find a wife. Uh, uh, and he wanted to marry Rachel, who was the daughter of his uncle Laban. Laban was uh, uh, Rebecca's brother so he was the uncle of Jacob so Laban and Jacob made a deal that he could marry uh, his daughter he wanted to marry Rachel he could marry her uh, but he had to work for seven years for Laban uh, so he did that he worked from and then instead of marrying Rachel he was tricked and uh, uh, Laban ended up having him marry his first daughter, uh, Leah. Um, and, and then uh, they made a second deal that he would be able to marry Rachel if he worked seven more years. So he's done that. And during that, that time, Rachel and Leah, Leah had a bunch of children and uh, Rachel was barren. Uh, she, she had him uh, use his handmaidens as kind of, surrogates to have children so and then finally Rachel was able to have children and she had finally two children uh, uh, Benjamin and uh, Joseph and, and Benjamin I don't know if she had Benjamin at this point yet that we're at I don't think so so but uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, but uh, now Jacob wants to leave with his family and all the wealth he's accumulated god blessed him greatly so he acquired a lot of wealth while he was working for laban he wants to leave but uh laban uh convinces him to stay and they make a deal and that's where we are now and make they make a business deal about uh, uh if he stays longer he can take his family and uh his his uh profits uh but he has to continue working there and, so this is where we are now. It says, um, verse, chapter 30, verse 30. I'm going to pick up right there. Uh, verse 29. And he said unto him, Thou knowest how I serve thee, and how thy cattle, uh, and how thy cattle was with me. For it was little which thou hadst before I came, and it is now increased unto a multitude. And the Lord hath blessed thee since my coming. And now, when shall I provide for mine own house also? And he said, what shall I give thee? And Jacob, this is um, Laban asking Jacob, well, what shall I give thee? And Jacob said, thou shalt not give me anything if thou wilt do this thing for me. I will again feed and keep thy flock. I will pass through all thy flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle and all the brown cattle from the sheep and the spotted and speckled among the goats and of such shall be my hire. So shall my righteousness answer for me in time to come when it shall come for my hire before thy face. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the sheep shall be counted stolen with me. And Laban said, Behold, I would it might be according to thy word. So they make this deal that uh, uh, Jacob will continue serving Laban. Uh, 
all the while he's been there, Laban's wealth has grown because God is blessing Jacob. And because he's working for Laban, he ends up having his wealth increase a lot. So they make this deal. He'll stay and continue working for a while. But uh, Jacob gets to keep the spotted animals. And the other animals will belong to uh, Laban. Let's read that in the Amplified. I want to get a better idea of the meaning of all that. Okay. So, um, same th section, but in the Amplified, beginning with verse 29, Jacob answered him, you, you know how I served you and how your possessions, your cattle and sheep and goats have fared with me. For you had little before I came, and it has increased and multiplied abundantly. And the Lord has favored you with blessings wherever I turned. But now, when shall I provide for my own house also? Laban said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this one thing for me, of which I am about to tell you, and I will again feed and take care of your flock. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted animal, and every black one among the sheep, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and shall and such shall be my wages. So the I imagine that the vast majority of these the animals were not spotted and speckled. Uh, and uh, so he was taking a small number from from among the entire uh, flock and, and uh, herd uh, for himself and the rest Laban could keep so and then it goes on in verse 33 so later when the matter of my wages is brought before you my fair dealing will be evident and answer for me everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the sheep if found with me shall be counted as stolen. So in other words, um, as the animals continue reproducing, all of them that are not speckled and spotted among the, the, the goats and the sheep uh, will, will, be, uh, will continue to be owned by Laban, and Jacob cannot take any of them. He can only take the spotted ones. And Laban said, good, let it be done as you say. So they strike a deal. And now let's look at verse 35. I'll read it first in the KJV. Thirty-five. And remove that day the he goats that were ring straight and spotted and all the she goats that were speckled and spotted and every one that had some white in it and all the human i mean all the brown among the sheep and uh, gave them into the hand of his sons and he set three days journey betwixt himself and jacob Uh, this is Laban that's uh, done this, uh, and and uh, and and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flock. And Jacob took him rods of green poplar, uh, uh, and of the hazel and chestnut tree, and pilled white strakes in them, and made them the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had pilled before the flock in the gutters in the waters, watering troughs when the flock came to drink, that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods uh, and brought forth cattle, ring straked, speckled, and spotted. <laughs> well, apparently, uh, I don't know how Jacob learned this. Apparently, God is instructing him on what to do because uh, in terms of um, breeding animals and uh, creating certain types of results from your breeding, uh, 
kind of like genetic engineering. Uh, I don't I don't think that that was really well known uh, these the, these techniques at that time, but somehow uh, Jacob was able to use this technique uh, in order to cause the speckled animals to reproduce more. And let's let me read that again in the Amplified. So in the Amplified it says, But that same day Laban removed the he-goats that were streaked and spotted and all the she-goats that were specked, speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it, and every black lamb, and put them in charge of his sons. Uh, and he set a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob. So the herds, uh, they, they are in the flock, are separated according to their agreement. Then there's three days journeys, the space between the two camps. Um, but Jacob took flesh, fresh rods of poplar and almond and plain trees and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white and the rods. Then he set the rods which he had peeled in front of the flocks in the watering troughs where the flock came to drink. And since they bred and conceived when they came to drink, the flocks bred and conceived inside of the rods and brought forth lambs and kids streaked, speckled, and spotted. Um, I, I don't know anything about uh, breeding and, and uh, this kind of thing to say if, if this kind of thing actually can cause uh, certain result that uh, Jacob was able to get or if God uh, God just caused his speckled animals to reproduce and uh, at a much higher rate than the, the animals that were given to Laban that, the Laban, that Laban kept uh, but the results will turn out to be outstanding. Now, what these reeds and these streaks in them have to do with it all, I don't know. If, if anybody knows anything about this can, and can tell me uh, uh, to see if this somehow influences the animals in any way. Uh, but uh, certainly, God has blessed Jacob in the past with great increase and and now he's continuing to bless him, so the speckled animals are going to reproduce uh, at a greater rate. J verse 40, Jacob separated the lambs, and as he had done with the peeled rods, he also set the faces of the flocks toward the streaked and all the dark in the new flock of Laban. And he put his own droves by themselves and did not let them breed with Laban's flock. And whenever the stronger animals were breeding, Jacob laid the rods in the watering troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed and conceive among the rods. But when the sheep and goats were feeble, he omitted putting the rods there, so the feebler animals were Laban's and stronger Jacob's. Thus the man increased and became exceedingly rich and had many sheep and goats and maidservants men servants, camels, and donkeys. <clears throat> so is this another uh, way that we can identify Jacob as being a schemer, trickster, uh, as he had been known in the past with his dealings with, uh, with Esau and uh, his father, uh, Isaac? Uh, is he just very smart and understands uh, how um, breeding works to get the best results? Or is God simply blessing him with uh, great results? Uh, I think it, uh, 
I think God's blessing him, but uh, it seems like at least separating the strong animals and the weak animals, it seems like there's some logic in that. Uh, then we go to verse chapter 31. Jacob heard Laban's sons complaining. Jacob had taken away all that was our father's. He has acquired all his wealth and honor from what belonged to our father. And Jacob noticed that Laban looked at him less favorably than before. And the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your people, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field, to, uh, to his flock. And he said to them, I see how your father looks at me, and he is not friendly toward me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know what I, you know that I have served your father with all my might and power. Hmm. <laughs> seemed like he had in the past. It seemed like this last, this last deal he made, there was some kind of, uh, he, he was certainly trying to get better results for himself than he was for Laban. But your father has deceived me and changed my wages 10 times. That's certainly true. Laban has taken great advantage of him, and, and Jacob has been very patient uh, the way he was tricked uh, into marrying Leah. And then they had to give seven more years of service so he could marry Rachel. And then all these other years of service while his uh, fox were growing. And then this final deal uh, where he could get the speckled animals. So uh, he has been, uh, uh, you know, victimized in a way. But but in the past, look what he's he's done. You know, he basically he stole his brother Esau's birthright. He deceived his father into giving him the blessing that was going to go to Esau. So what goes around comes around, but God is still with Jacob because his, his promise was to Abraham and his descendants through a line that is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, so now it says, um, verse 8, if he said the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flock bore speckled. And if he said, the streaked shall be your hire, then all the flock bore streaked. Thus God has taken away the flocks of your father and given them to me. And, and, I, and I had a dream at the time the flock conceived. I took up, looked up, and saw that the rams which mated with the she-goats were streaked, speckled, and spotted. And the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here am I. And he said, look up and, and see all the rams which meet with the flock are streaked, speckled, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban does to you. For I am the God of Beth Bethel, uh, where you anointed the pillar and where you vowed a vow to me. Now arise, get out from this land and return to your native land. So... This is ordained by God. God spoke to him in this vision and, and told him that this would happen and what to do. And now he's at the point where he has this great wealth and he's going to be leaving Laban after all these years of service, all these wives, all these maidservants, all of these uh, children. Um, and verse 14 says, And Rachel and Leah answered him, Is there any portion or inheritance for us? in our father's house. Are we not counted by him as strangers? For he sold us and has also quite devoured our money, the price we paid for us. Huh. So now Rachel and Leah are also getting involved in feeling that they have been uh, kind of ripped off by their father. Uh, verse 16, for all the riches which God has taken from our father are ours and our children's. Now then, Whatever God has said to you, do it. <laughs> so they certainly see that God is on the side of Jacob and that uh, he's the one, God has caused all these good things to come to Jacob. And they're happy about that. And they're all in favor of Jacob leaving with them, his family, and the wealth he's accumulated. Verse 17, then Jacob arose up and set his sons and his wives upon the camels 
and he drove away all his livestock and all his gain which he had gotten, the livestock which he had obtained and accumulated in Padan Aram to go to Isaac, his father, in the land of Canaan. Now, Laban had gone to shear his sheep, possibly to the feast of sheep shearing, and Rachel stole her father's household good, gods. Wow. Rachel. Why would she steal her father's household gods? These gods are, of course, false gods. They're idols. You know, they're probably carved idols um, from wood or gold. And, uh, and she steals them. Does she steal them because she believes in these gods or because they're made out of gold and they're valuable? Um, verse 20, And Jacob outwitted Laban the Syrian, Aramean, and in that, in that he did not tell him that he intended to flee and slip away secretly. So he fled with all that he had and arose and crossed the river Euphrates and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. But on the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he took his kinsmen with him and pursued after Jacob for seven days, and they overtook him in the hill country of Gilead. Well, it seemed like, you know, he should have the right to take his family and his uh, property and leave. Uh, but uh, somehow, I guess uh, Laban has not agreed and for some reason uh, feels he has some right to, to that property, even though Jacob has worked for it all this time. It says in verse 24, but God came to Laban, Laban, this Syrian, in a dream by night and said to him, be careful that you do not speak from good to bad to Jacob, peaceably and then violently. Then Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent on the hill and Laban coming with his kinsmen pitched his tents on the same hill of Gilead. So God spoke to Laban in a dream and warned him about how he was to deal with, with uh, um, Jacob. And Laban said to Jacob, what do you mean stealing away and leaving like this without my knowing it and carrying off my daughters as if captives of the sword? God. He's got a lot of nerve. I mean, his daughters. Why would he think they're his daughters? Now they're they're Jacob's wives. Why does he have a right to them after the agreements that they've made and all the work that uh, uh, Jacob's done? It seems very, very unfair the way that Laban is looking at this. In verse twenty-seven. Why did you flee secretly and cheat me and did not tell me? It doesn't seem that. Jacob cheated him, but he did leave secretly, uh, so that I might have sent you away with joy and gladness and with singing, with tambourine and lyre. <laughs> I don't think Jacob was uh, pretty, pretty confident that if he told Laban he wanted to leave, that it, uh, it would uh, go peaceably. In verse 28, and why did you not permit me to kiss my daughters? Uh, my, my, kiss my sons and grandchildren, my daughters, goodbye. Now you have done foolishly in behaving like this. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Be careful that you do not speak from good to bad to Jacob, well, peaceably, then violently. Verse 30, And now you felt you must go because you were homesick for your father's house. But why did you steal my household gods? Uh-oh. Jacob doesn't even know about that. Jake, verse 31, Jacob answered Laban, because I was afraid, for I thought, suppose you would take your daughters from me by force. The one with whom you find those gods of yours, let him not live. Wow. 
so Jacob is telling Laban, who, you know, whoever took your gods, when we discover who it is, you can kill them. It's fair. It's just. Here before our kinsmen, search my possessions and take whatever you find that belongs to you. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the images. Wow. Verse 33, so Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent in the tent of the two maids, but did not find them. Then he went from Leah's tent into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the images, these gods, and put them in the camel saddle and sat on them. Laban searched and felt through all the tent, but did not find them. And Rachel said to her father, do not be displeased, my lord that I can't, cannot rise up before you, for the period of women is upon me, and I am unwell. Gosh, the deceit of these people, you know? It just seems like one after another, they're liars. Abraham uh, lied about Sarah not being his wife. Isaac lied about Rebecca not being his wife. Uh, and now we got and, and, and Jacob. Uh, he, he lied about, uh, if I remember correctly, he lied about Rachel not being his wife. And now we've got, and, and uh, look at Rebecca, her scheming along with Jacob. Part of that scheme to uh, deceive Isaac regarding the blessing that was supposed to go to Esau. So Rebecca, now Rachel, stealing and lying about it. And these people are heroes of the scriptures. So I guess we should not be too hard on ourselves, uh, knowing that. Uh, these Old Testament saints uh, will be celebrating with them in, in heaven someday. And uh, they're just as guilty as we are, even though they are the great characters of the scriptures. Um, and he says, um, and he searched, that's Laban searched, but did not find the gods. Then Jacob became angry and reproached and argued with Laban. And Jacob said to Laban, What is my fault? What is my sin that you so hotly pursued me? So now Jacob has this righteous indignation that, that uh, Laban has pursued him and is falsely accusing him of stealing these gods of, that belong to Laban. Not, uh, and he's unaware that Rachel really st did steal them. Verse 37, although you have searched and felt through all my household possessions, what have you found of all your household goods? Put it here before my brethren and yours that they may judge and decide between us. These 20 years have I, the years I have been with you, your ewes and your she goats have not lost their young and the rams of your flock have not been eaten by by me it is true that uh, jacob faithfully worked and served for him and, and it was a great uh, value to uh, laban verse 39 i did not bring you the carcasses of the animals torn by wild beasts i bore the loss of it wow you required of me to make good all that was stolen whether it occurred by day or by night this was my lot. By day, the heat consumed me, and by night, the cold, and I could not sleep. I have been 20 years in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks, and you have changed my wages 10 times. And if the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the, and the dread, lest he should fall, and fear, lest he offend, I, I, of Isaac, had not been with me, surely you would have sent me away now empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and humiliation and the wearying labor of my hands. 
and rebuked you last night. So he's saying that God must have taken the stuff and have rebuked him, I guess. In verse 43, Laban answered Jacob, these daughters are my daughters. These children are my children. He's referring to the grandchildren. Uh, these flocks are my flocks and all that you see is mine. But what can I do today to these, my daughters, or to these, to their children whom they have born? So come now, let us make a covenant or league, you and I, and let it be for a witness between you and me. So Jacob set up a stone for a pillar or monument. And Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, and they ate together there upon the heap. Laban called it Jegar Saduth. Sahadutha, that means witness heap in Aramaic. But Jacob called it Galid, which means witness heap in Hebrew. Uh, Laban said, this heap is a witness today between you and me, therefore it was named Galid. And the pillar or monument was called Mizpah, which means watch post, for he, Laban, said, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent and hidden from, from another. If you should afflict, humiliate, or lower, or divorce my daughters, or if you should take otherwise beside my daughters, although no man is with us to witness, see, remember, God is witness between you and me. And Laban said to Jacob, See this heap and this pillar, which I have set up between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness, that I will not pass by this heap to you, and that you will not pass by this heap and this pillar to me for harm. The God of Abraham, and the God of Nahor, and the God of the, the object of worship of their father, Terah and I idolater, judge between us. But Jacob swore only by the, the, the one true God, the dread and fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered his sacrifice on the mountain and called his brethren to eat food. And they ate food and lingered all night on the mountain. And early in the morning, Laban rose up and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and pronounced a blessing, asking God's favor on them. Then Laban departed and returned to his home. Yeah. So, that is chapter 30 in this long, enduring experience of service that J Jacob gave to Laban. And so now they're parting company and Jacob is going back to his father's land with his wives and children and all this wealth. All right, so now let's go to verse 31, uh, chapter 31. Let me see. Um, and he heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's, and of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this glory. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not toward him as before. Hmm. And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. And Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field of his flock. Hmm. And said to them, to them, I see your father's countenance that it is not toward me as before, but the God of my father hath been with me. And ye know that with all my power I have served your father, 
and your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God suffered him not to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckled shall be thy wages, and then all the cattle bear speckled. And if he said thus, the ring shake straked shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring straked. Oh, my mistake. I'm rereading that chapter, chapter 31. Okay. Let's go to chapter 32 here. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of that place Manahim. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban, and stayed there until now. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting encounter with uh, Esau again. Look at that in the Amplified. Uh, verse 5, uh, and, and I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, men servants, and women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find mercy and kindness in your sight. So he sends a messenger off to Esau, his brother, who is already sworn to kill him. And that's why he originally left his, his father's land, uh, because he had you know, basically stolen the, the birthright and, and the blessing that was going to go to Esau. Esau was so angry, it's where he would kill his brother. Uh, Jacob. So now he's returning and he's assuming his brother still wants to kill him. And, uh, and the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and now he is on the way to meet you. Uh-oh. And 400 men are with him. Wow. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two groups, thinking, if Esau comes to the one group and smites it, then the other group which is left will escape. <laughs> I was thinking, Jacob. Uh, verse 9, Jacob said, oh, my God. O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your people, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercy and loving kindness and all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff and I path, my staff, I passed over this Jordan long ago, and now I have be become two companies. Well, it certainly is true what he said. I am not worthy of all, all this mercy and blessings he's gotten because he's really been a deceitful uh, schemer. But what he did to others was done to him. Verse 11, deliver me, I pray you, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and smite us all, the mothers uh, with the children. And you, said, and you said, I will surely do you good and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. And Jacob lodged there that night and took from what he had with him as a present for his brother Esau. 200 she goats, 20 he goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 
30 milk camels with their colts, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 sheep donkeys, and 10 donkey colts. And he put them in the, in the charge of his servant, every, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, pass over before me and put a space between drove and drove. And he commanded the first, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks to whom you belong, where you, where you are going, and whose are the animals before you, then you shall say, they are your servant Jacob's. It is a present sent to my Lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. Well, and so he commanded the second and third, the third and all that followed the drove saying, this is what you are to say to Esau when you meet him. And say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. So he's got these, these great gifts in, in three different positions. And uh, it's the plan is, as Esau approaches, he gets this one gift from his brother, already very valuable. And, and then he can, if Esau continues on, he'll see another gift and then a third gift. And he's certainly hoping that uh, this is going to appease his brother and soften his heart, and take away his hatred and, and uh, vow to kill him. Uh, and say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. And after a while, I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present went on before him and he himself lodged that night in the camp. But he rose up that same night and took his two wives, his two women servants, and his 11 sons and passed over the, over the ford of the Jabbok. And he took them and sent them across the brook. Also, he sent over all that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And the man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and Jacob's thigh was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you declare a blessing upon me. The man, he asked him, what is your name? And in shock of realization, whispering, he said, Jacob, which means supplanter, schemer, trickster, swindler. And he said, your name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, which means contender with God. For you have contended and have power with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, tell me, I pray you, what in contrast is your name? But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And the angel of God declared a blessing on Jacob there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, the face of God, saying, For I have seen the face of God, God face to face, and my life is spared and not snatched away. And as he passed Peniel, the sun rose up, and he was limping because of his thigh. But that is why this day the Israelites do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the hollow of the thigh, because the angel of the Lord touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, on the sinew of his head. This encounter where Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord, um, I've discussed this in much more detail in our study of um, the angel of the Lord, uh, Theophanies and Christophanies. So I hope you go to watch that and you'll understand that um, God has appeared uh, many times throughout history, even before the incarnation of Jesus, his, his birth in Bethlehem, even before that, here's an example of it, where God makes an appearance. So I suggest you go and watch the, uh, the character study we did on uh, the angel of the Lord. 
So let's go down to see what happens with chapter 33, what happens with Jacob and Esau now. And Jacob raised his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and with him 400 men. So he divided the children to Leah and to Rachel and to the two maids. And he put the maids at their children in front, Leah and her children after them, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. Then Jacob went over the stream before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Wow. This is quite, quite an undertaking that Jacob is doing to appease his brother, giving him a series, a series of three different large gifts. Uh, and and then and as he sees him bowing and then coming forward and then bowing again, and then coming forward and bowing again, seven talents of time bowing to Esau. Let's see if it doesn't do any good. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. <laughs> that strikes me as the kind of the parable of the, what's called the parable of the prodigal son. I prefer to call it the parable of the backslidden son. Uh, because uh, the same thing happened as the, the son was coming back, uh, the father's reaction was not anger that the son had left and gotten into trouble and, and, and blew his inheritance. And, you know, the father's reaction was he just wanted to hug him and kiss him. And this is Esau's reaction. And uh, Esau uh, really from everything I've seen about Esau, uh, he, he's more admirable to me than Jacob. Esau just means a red because he was a redhead and was hairy with hairy and a lot of hairy hair. In him. Well, everything I've learned about Esau, there's really not much fault you can find him except he didn't take his his inheritance seriously. He sold it to Jacob for a bowl of stew and uh, but other than that look he's look how forgiving he is here and uh, God uh, promised that he would be blessed too and he certainly was he's, he's a very wealthy man in his own right now and so but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Esau looked up and saw the women and the children and said, Who are these with you? And Jacob replied, They are the children whom God has graciously given your servants. Then the maids came near and they, ran, they and their children and they bowed themselves. And Leah also with her children came near and they bowed themselves. After them, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed themselves. The only one missing here right now, of course, is Benjamin, who is not yet born. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, these are that I might find favor in the sight of my Lord. And when he says my Lord here, uh, it's Lord would it's not a capital L Lord. It's not Lord in Greek, the kurios, which means God Almighty. When, when Jesus is referred to as Lord by the Apostle Paul throughout, uh, and that use of the word Lord means Lord God Almighty. Uh, but when we talk about Esau being the Lord, we, Jacob calling Esau Lord, Esau Lord, Sarah calling Abraham Lord, it's just a respect to saying you are, uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm here to serve you. You're, uh, in this case, Jacob was, you know, you know, bowing and being subservient and saying, hey, this is a sign of respect to you. You refer to him as Lord, but it's not 
Lord in the sense of, you know, God and, and uh, Lord that I worship. And Esau said, I have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. This Esau, wow, I like him. But Jacob replied, no, I beg of you. If now I have found favor in your sight, receive my gift that I am presenting. For truly, to see your face is to, is to me as if I had seen the face of God, and you have received me favorably. Except I beg of you my blessing and gift that I have brought to you, for God has dealt graciously with me, and I have everything. And he kept urging him, and he accepted it. Wow. So, why did Jacob keep insisting? Uh, was it because his guilty conscience, he felt he really wanted, sincerely wanted to give it to him, kind of clear his conscience for what he's done? Um, was it because he knew that God had blessed him and will continue to bless him and wealth was not an issue for him? He knew that God would always bless him. Uh, but eventually Esau did say yes. Uh, then Esau said, let us get started on our journey and I will go before you. But Jacob replied, you know, my Lord, that the children are tender and delicate and need gentle care. And the flocks and herds with young are of concern to me. For if the men should overdrive them for a single day, the whole of the flocks would die. Let my Lord, I pray you, pass over before his servant, and I will lead them on slowly, governed by my consideration for the livestock that set the pace before me and the endurance of the children until I come to my Lord in Seir. Then Esau said, let me now leave with you some of the people who are with me. But Jacob said, what need is there for it? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau turned back that day on his way to Seir. But Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built himself a house and made booths or places of shelter for his livestock. So the name of the place is called Succoth Booths. When Jacob came from Padaram, he arrived safely and in peace at the town of Shechem in the land of Canaan and pitched his tents before the enclosed town. Then he bought the piece of land on which he had encamped from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father for a hundred pieces of money. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohe Israel, God, the God of Israel. Okay, I guess this is a good place to stop for now. Uh, the end of chapter 33. Uh, there's more to be said about Jacob. And mostly we're going to be transitioning from Jacob now to his children, particularly his uh, son Joseph. So that's where we'll, we'll go in the in the next the next Sunday. Uh, so for now, I will close this study off. And as is my practice, uh, I don't want to end any study without offering an invitation. Uh, for you to receive the free gift of salvation. Uh, I know that some people watching this have already received the free gift. Uh, maybe you're watching this and you don't even know what I'm talking about. The free gift of salvation. But you can learn all hundreds of theological subjects. But the one theological subject that is of utmost importance, is primary and is preeminent, and is the subject of soteriology. That's the subject of salvation. See, the scripture tells us that uh, Adam and Eve were the first humans, and they fell because of sin. And all of their descendants, of which we are descendants of Adam and Eve, uh, we are born wrong. We are born with a birth defect, uh, a, a genetic defect. It's called the, the sin nature. 
Every one of us is born as a sinner. Now, from when you were first born and as soon as you were able to, you began to sin, just as I did. No one had to teach me or you how to lie. Because by the time we're two or three years old or something, you just start lying. <laughs> no one no one taught us how to do it. And uh, we have been doing the wrong thing our whole lives. Now I know that some people sin more than others. Some people really do their best to not sin. But we can't help it because it's it's who we are. It's it's genetic. And uh, I know that uh, some of us have other preferred sins. We have proclivities for certain types of sins. It's not it's not the type of sin, and it's not the the quantity of sin that is the issue here. The issue is we are sinners from birth, it is our nature. And because we're sinners, we cannot have a relationship with God. God wants to embrace us. God wants a relationship with us. That's why he created mankind. But here we are and here God is and then there's sin and we can't get together. It's like a magnetic repulsion. And throughout history, man has tried to solve this problem on, on his own. Man has invented all kinds of religions. And every religion in the world is really the same. And every religion is based on the merit system. Man thinks, rationalizes, if I could be good, God will accept me. But no matter how hard we try to be good, we're still sinners by, by nature. It's, it's not even what we do that's the problem, it's what we are. We were born wrong. We need to be born again, spiritually. So if you're trying to get, please God, and work your way to heaven and say, if I just do enough good things, and if I have enough restraint and stop doing the bad things. See, we know in our conscience, our conscience tells us that, you know, what's right and wrong. And today there's this principle of moral relativity where everybody just decides what's right and wrong and wrong, but inside we really all know. And, but if you think that you can through your own effort, stop doing bad things and do a lot of good things, and then God will be pleased and accept you. You're going to be sadly disappointed at the judgment because no matter how hard we try to strive to please God, scriptures tell us that we all fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, if you're going to try to do this on your own through practicing religion, you're going to miss the mark and fall short, and you won't be able to go to heaven because you'll still be a sinner by nature. You need to be born again. You need to be born right. You need to be born spiritually from above. How do you do that? Well, God understood our problem. He knew that we could not solve this sin problem on our own. And so God loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to, to solve the problem. And scriptures tell us that Jesus Christ was in heaven as God, as the word of God. And then he came down from heaven and was manifest in the flesh and became the son of God. Jesus Christ. Jesus said the reason he did that, the reason he became a man, was so that he could die. Of course, he couldn't. God can't die. He's eternal. But he, Jesus could become a man, and in that way he could die. He needed to die because the scriptures tell us the wages of sin is death. But 
The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the wages of our sin is death. We all must die just because of sin. But Jesus came, became a man, and he died on a cross, taking our place, suffering and dying for us. When he was suffering and dying on that cross, all of our sins, from the, from the time we're born to the time we die, every sin that we would ever do in our lives, collectively, all the sins of mankind were charged against Jesus on that cross. Scripture says he became sin for us. So he, the Bible says he's the propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The sins of the whole world charged against Jesus Christ. So now the sin problem is resolved. We can have a relationship with God, but God doesn't force you. God offers you a relationship. He offers you life everlasting. It's a free gift. The uh, Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. And it's available to you now. You can have it simply by putting your faith in Jesus. Now, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? It means that you no longer believe in your own efforts. No longer will you strive to work your way to heaven thinking that you can do it on, uh, through personal merit. Reject that and say, no, Jesus is the way. Believe what he said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come under the, under the Father but by me. So stop trying to do it your way and do it God's way. Scripture says that they have tried to establish their own righteousness instead of just accepting the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. So put your faith in Jesus. Your sins are paid for. He will credit you with his righteousness, and he, you, then you can embrace Jesus, and you will be born again. You are born from your mother's womb physically as a sinner. You were born wrong. Now put your faith in Jesus, and be born a second time, but this time born spiritually from above. And scripture tells us that when we do that, we become a child of God. Once you're a child of God, you're always a child of God. You can never, that status can never be changed. Uh, even if you misbehave, do things wrong, or, you know, you can never stop being a child of God. Just like the prodigal son story again. Prodigal son went off and got into trouble, but he never stopped being the man's son. The father never stopped loving him, even though he got off into trouble. So, put your faith in Jesus. Now, it's called faith because, because uh, the Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for. We hope for this salvation, this eternal life. Uh, through Jesus Christ, it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We haven't seen Jesus. We haven't touched him. The Apostle Thomas was told that Jesus was raised from the dead. And he said, I'm not going to believe that unless I see him and touch him and put my fingers in his wounds. Well, well I'm asking you to have faith in Jesus even though you can't see him and touch him. The Bible says, that uh, it, without faith is impossible to please God. So believe in Jesus. Now, why should you? Why should you believe in it instead of thinking that this is just a story? It's not history. It is history. It is his story. The story of Jesus Christ is a true story. It's a love story about how much God loves us. Why should you do, believe it? Because of the resurrection. Jesus said that he would give a sign to prove who he is so you could have to be confident in trusting him. And he said the sign was the resurrection. He said it would raise himself from the dead. So he was crucified, he died, he was in a tomb for three days, and then he raised himself from the dead, and he appeared to the apostles and hundreds of other people. 
Dupurvi has power over life and death. And because of this resurrection, you can feel confident, you can feel justified in putting your faith in Him. Will you do it now? Put your faith in Jesus. If you do, make a comment on this video. I'd love to hear about it. I hope you join me next week in the study next Sunday when we continue studying about Jacob and his sons. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.